Hello and welcome to Bay College's online lectures for college algebra. This is section 3.1 which deals with functions. As we begin this section, the first thing we want to do is define what is a function. Well, a function is defined as a correspondence in which all the values in the first set that we call domain, which we'll define shortly, correspond to exactly one set in the second set, or one value in the second set, which we call the range. Now, essentially what that means, to break it down in layman's terms, is anything in our first set, our x value, can't be repeated, which means if x is 2, it has to correspond to one y value, maybe 5. x can't correspond to 5 and 6, or you know, two numbers. So it corresponds to just one value. Our input, which we'll call x, has to equal just one output which we'll call y. So the domain, the domain is defined as all the possible x values, all the possible input values. And the range is defined as all the possible output values. If I put in a value of x, I'm going to get out a single value of y if we're dealing with functions. Now, if we're talking about relations, relations can cor correspond to one or more y values, one or more y values, which means a relation can be a function. A relation could also not be a function. But all functions are relations. And I know that's kind of semantics there. But a relation is always, or excuse me, a function is always a relation. But a relation is not necessarily a function. So let's look at these values here. If we look at this first set, we're going to determine if this, is, this correspondence is a function or if it's merely just a relation. So if we look at this, we have negative 1 for an x value, 7 for a y value, 0, 6, negative 2, 2, 5, 6. Well, in order to be a function, each x value only corresponds to one y value. x does not repeat. Well, negative 1, 0, negative 2, and 5 are all unique values. So this would be defined as a function because it corresponds to just one y value for each x value. So if we're going to define the range, range, or excuse me, domain, domain is all the possible input values. Well, for this set, if we look at this, we can see in order from least to greatest, my domain is going to be negative 2 right here, negative 1, 0, and 5. These are my input values, or my x values. If we want to find the range, which is all the possible output values or y values, we say, well, here we have 7, 6, 2, and 6. Well, we're going to have 2, 6, and 7. Now, it's OK that this function has a repeated y value, because the x value doesn't repeat it. So this is a function. And I'll just say f here as a function. Now, let's look at the next example. Let's determine if this relation is a function. Well, if I notice here, negative 2 and negative 2, the x value is repeating, which means when x is negative 2, it corresponds to 4 and 3. That tells me right there that this relation is not a function. But we can still find its domain. What is the input value? Well, we have negative 7, we have negative 2, and we have positive 6. So that is my domain. That's my possible input values. My range, my possible y values or output values, we have 4, 3, 4, and 8. Well, if we put those in order from least to greatest, 3, 4, and 8. Now, notice the value of 4 repeated, but that's OK. We can have that in a relation or a function. All right, now let's look at this last example. This basically says x and y such that y equals 4x minus 5. And hopefully we recognize this as being a linear equation, slope of 4, intercept of negative 5. Well, if we're looking to find the domain, we just have to say, what are the possible input values? Well, I can put any value in for x and get out any value for y, or a corresponding value for y. So the domain in this case 
would be all real numbers. Or you would write x such that x is all real numbers. Uh, depends on uh, set notation or interval notation, negative infinity to infinity. I'm just going to write the symbol for all real numbers. <clears throat> now to determine the range, well, as x gets larger, this value is going to get more and more positive. If uh, x gets smaller into the negatives, this is going to get more and more negative. So we see the range is also all real numbers. So our domain and range are the same. All right, let's move on here. Let's talk about function notation. Now, we're f we should be familiar with seeing uh, equations like this, y equals 4x plus 5. And we can always find values. If I look at this, I have x is equals 1, y equals 9. Our input is 1, our output is 9 for this particular correspondence here. And I can plug that in and check 4 times 1 is, in fact, 4. 4 plus 5 is 9, so when I plug in 1, I get out 9. Now, when we're talking about function notation, essentially what we're saying is, how do we distinguish between this line and some other line? If I have two y values, it does not necessarily mean that all the x's are the same for each function, or all the y's are going to be the same for each function. So we use something called function notation. This here, f of x, basically says my input is x, and my output is the result of that. x is called our argument. So I can rewrite this function to say this. Now, if I had a different function, maybe I'd use a different symbol. Maybe I'd say g of x equals some other line. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we can assess this in function notation and even write it, our ordered pairs in function notation. As one example here, if I say, well, if x is 1, I'm finding f of 1. I replace the x value with 1. Well, if I do that here, I also have to do it here. This is an equal sign. What I do to one side, I do to the other. And since these are e equivalent, I have to put in that value. 4 times 1 plus 5. And now I can actually do the math. And 4 plus 5 is 9. So what this says is when I evaluate this function for 1 in function notation, my result is 9. So when x is 1, y is 9. And that's exactly what we have here. Now, function notation, our input is the x value. And our output is the function evaluated at that x. So in this case, we get that value once we put in 1. And once we evaluate the function for 1, we get 9. So that's just different notation. So hopefully we can become familiar with that. And let's take a look at evaluating functions when they're using function notation. Here it says f of 3. Well, let's take this function right here and evaluate it for what's given. It says f of 3. Well, I'm going to take the function 4 times x plus 5. And because the x is replaced with 3, I have to replace the x with 3. Well, 4 times 3 is 12, plus 5 is 17. So now what I can do is write it as an ordered pair, x and f of x. Well, I put in 3. And when I did this, 12 plus 5 is 17. So we still write it as an ordered pair x, y. Well, now it's x, f of x, just different notation. Here it asks us to find f of 2x. Well, 4 times x plus 5, I'm replacing the x value with everything in these parentheses here. It is 2x. And then I can do some simplifying here. And I get 4 times 2x is 8x. So let's just do this. Our input is 2x. And my output is going to be 8x plus 5. So you notice it's not a nice number here because we still have a variable. But this would be the ordered pair for evaluating it at 2x. Let's look at this here. It says f of x plus 1. Well, in place of my x value, I'm putting in x plus 1. Now, if I do some simplifi simplification here, 
I'm putting in x plus 1 as my x value, my input value. And now I can simplify it 4 times x plus 4. I just distribute it. And 4 and 5 is 9. So I get 4x plus 9 as my output. All right, and lastly, we have f of x plus 1. Now notice what's in the parentheses is still x. So it's not changing the function. It's still 4 times x, the value in this parentheses, plus 5. But now we're adding something outside of this notation. So it basically tells me to add 1 to it. So what happened here? Well, I didn't really change the function. I just added 1 to it. So this function, it really doesn't change the point. I still get x, f of x, but I'm adding 1 to the value. All right. Now, let's discuss uh, one more topic here. What we've seen here is something called explicit uh, view, I guess, of these values or of these functions. What about when they're in implicit view? Essentially, what this is right here is implicit. It doesn't really tell me which one's my dependent variable, which one's my independent variable, which I did forget to define. Um, x is our dependent variable, generally. It's uh, our input value. And the output, what we get when we plug in the value, is our dependent variable. Because what we put in is going to determine what we get out of it. So if this is our independent variable, then y is our dependent, because it depends on what we put in for x. To write this in explicit form so we can use function notation, this is general form. We essentially just solve it for y. Solve for our dependent variable. And if I do that, I get y equals, I'm just adding 4x to both sides. And now it's explicit. So we could write it in function notation. f of x equals this value or, or whatever, because this is a function. If we look at this, well, let's try and write this in uh, explicit form here. I just subtract 2x from both sides. And I get y squared equals negative 2x plus 1. Well, is this a function? Well, let's think about domain and range. Well, I can put in any value for the domain. But what am I going to get out when I evaluate it? Well, because this is squared, how would I solve this for y? If I want to solve this for y, I have to introduce a square root. I get plus or minus negative 2x plus 1. Well, guess what? There are two values. For one value of x, I'm going to get out two values of y. This is not a function. And when we, <coughs> excuse me, when we write it in explicit form, we'll actually see that. Hey, this is not a function because for each value of x, I'm going to get out a positive and a negative. It corresponds to two values of y. x is actually repeating here. x equals this y value, and that same x equals another y value. <coughs> excuse me. All right, moving on. Let's uh, return to domain for a moment. When we're asked to find domain, what are our possible input values, what we have to realize is there are domain restrictions. And I wrote the two possible domain restrictions. <clears throat> One of them is when we have a square root or an even uh, indexed root. We cannot graph or find a real value when x is less than 0. So this value has to be greater than or equal to 0. And I'll just write that right here. The value under the radical has to be greater than or equal to 0. It cannot be negative. If we look at this here, well, we have a variable in the denominator. And we know we can never divide by 0, so our denominator here cannot equal 0. It could be positive, it could be negative, as long as it's not equal to 0. So when we're looking to find domain, we just have to say, is there any radical or is there any x's in denominators? So let's use that concept and find the domain of these following functions. If f of x equals 4x plus 5, which we've already seen, looking at this, there's no radical. There's no uh, x's in denominators. So I can plug in any value of x, and I'll get out any value of y. So our domain 
is all real numbers, or x such that x is all real numbers. Let's look at this g of x. And I just want to point out one reason why we use function notation is because this function is different than this function. Using function notation, I can actually see, well, f is not the same as g. If these were both y's, how would I distinguish them apart? Well, if this is y, this is y, does that mean this is the same as that? No. That's why we use function notation. Now, let's say, uh, let's find the domain for this here. If we look, we see, hey, we have a square root of a value. Well, that just tells me in order to find the domain, this value has to be greater than or equal to 0. So maybe in the margins of my notes, I can take this equation and solve for x, and I will have my domain. Well, I just need to subtract 4 from both sides. So my x value must be greater than or equal to negative 4. That is the domain for this function. x must be greater than or equal to negative 4. And we can always test that by plugging in some values. Let's say x is 0, because 0 is greater than negative 4. I get 0 plus 4 is square root, or 4. Square root of 4 is 2. That's a real value, uh, an output. What if I choose a value that's less than negative 4, not in my domain? Let's say negative 5. Well, negative 5 plus 1 is negative 1. And the square root of negative 1, well, that's our definition of an imaginary number, so it's not real. So I know that this is, in fact, my domain. Now here we have another function that I'm going to call h of x. h of x equals 1 over 4 minus x. First thing I notice is there is an x in the denominator. Well, we can never divide by 0. So right here in the margins, I'm going to say 4 minus x cannot equal 0. And now I can solve that uh, non-equality, right? Because we don't want it to equal. I can subtract 4 from both sides and then change the sign of x by dividing or multiplying through by negative 1. And I get x cannot equal positive 4. And let's just see. Let's check that. 4 minus 4 is 0. I can never divide by 0. So my domain is x such that x is not equal to 4. Or I could write uh, an interval from negative infinity to 4 using a parenthesis union symbol. 4 to infinity, any value but 4. Now, this here is going to be your quiz. I want you to try it for yourself. And you notice I basically combined these concepts here, all three of them. Now, notice our domain restrictions, we only have to worry about square roots and x's in denominators. Well, here we have a square root with an x in the denominator. This is the only thing that's going to determine our domain. This doesn't, because this is in the numerator. Just like this had all real numbers, we're not going to worry about this. We're just going to find any domain restrictions using what's in the denominator here, because it has a radical and that. So we know it can't equal 0. Here we said it could equal 0. Well, here it can't. So set that up, work through, show your work. The next thing we're going to look at is the algebra of functions. Essentially, we've done this before. We can combine like terms or find the difference of terms. But now we're using function notation. And we have to understand that this function, f of x, plus some other function, g of x, the only thing is they both have the same dependent or independent variable. So <clears throat> one thing we should know is there's two ways to represent this. We have the function f of x plus the function g of x is the same thing as saying f plus g of x. Please realize that it, this does not mean x times the functions. It does not indicate multiplication. It's just a type of notation. f of x minus g of x is the same as saying f minus g of x. And f of x times g of x is the same as saying f times g of x. It just means this is what they're being evaluated for. It does not mean multiplication. Now, when we do addition, subtraction, and multiplication, the domain of these functions is the combination of both f and g. So we have to look at the domain of f and look at the domain of g. And when we do some algebra to them, whether we add them, subtract them, or multiply, we were looking for their intersection. Where do they have the same domain? It has to be f and g. Remember, and tells us intersection. But when we come to 
division or the quotient of functions, f of x divided by g of x, it's the same as saying f divided by g of x, what we're evaluating it for. We have to take into consideration the domain of f and g, but because this function's in the denominator, it's not allowed to equal 0, so this becomes a domain restriction. So we have to find that domain restriction. So let's look at some examples here. I have f of x equals x plus 1, and g of x equals the square root of x plus 1. Let's find f plus g of x. Well, that just tells me take f of x and add g of x. So f of x plus g of x. Now, I would do any simplification if I could, but I really can't here because it's just addition. I have three different terms. f minus g of x, well, that's f of x, this value right here, minus g of x. And because of this radical, there's really not much I can do. I cannot distribute that negative through. That's on the outside. So all the simplification I can do is already done. And then finally, f times g of x. Now, x plus 1 times the square root of x plus 1. We could leave it like that, or we could distribute this. So I'd have x times the square root of x plus 1 plus 1 times this is just the square root of x plus 1. Let's do that for a moment. x times the square root of x plus 1. I distribute it to the first uh, term, and then this, I distribute the second term. So I have the square root of, uh, or x times the square root of x plus 1 plus the square root of x plus 1. But if we think about it, we could do something more to this if we use our rules of exponents, and I'll do that right here. This is x plus 1 to the first power, and this is x plus 1 to the 1 half power. So if we notice, these have the same base. So this is 1, that's 1 half. We could actually add them using our product rule of exponents. So if your answer comes out to be x plus 1 to the 3 halves, 1 and 1 half is 3 halves, this is also a simplified answer. So keep that in mind when you're working in doing college algebra, sometimes your answer isn't going to match what's in the back of the book, because maybe you did it this way, maybe you did it that way. But uh, you can always check your work. Work it backwards, make sure you got it right. All right, so we added, we subtracted, and we multiplied. What we haven't done yet is looked at this case right here. Now, one thing I forgot to do is look at their domains. Here we notice x plus 1, this domain, and I'll write it right above it, the domain is all real numbers. What about the domain of this one? Well, the domain here, this value has to be greater than or equal to 0. So x must be greater than or equal to negative 1. So the domain of g of x and the intersection of all real numbers says, well, this is x greater than or equal to negative 1. This domain is the domain of all of these, adding, subtracting, and multiplying, so the domain is their intersection, which just happens to be the domain of g of x. Now, let's go and look at the quotient rule here. And in the quotient rule, or well, not the quotient rule, but since we're dividing here, f divided by g of x, I'm going to write it out, x plus 1 is being divided by g of x, which is the square root of x plus 1. Now here, if we look at it, maybe we'd want to rationalize the denominator or do something along those lines. But let's first consider that domain, because when we do division, we have to realize that there's a new domain restriction. This was all real numbers, so I'm not going to concern myself with this. But now this value, it's a square root, so it can't be negative. But it's also in the denominator, so it can't be 0. This value has to be greater than 0. So to find the domain of this function, I'm going to say x plus 1 has to be greater than 0. I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides. My domain is x such that x must be greater than negative 1. So I can't use negative 1, because that would make this 0. The square root of 0 is 0, but now I have a 0 in my denominator. So this is my domain. 
All right, and we could do some simplification here, and I'll do it just uh, for review of our rules of exponents. This is x plus 1, and this is x plus 1 to the 1 half, right? Square root just means a 1 half power. Now, what I can do there is use the quotient rule of exponents. Know your rules of exponents. It'll be very helpful. I have one of these over half of them. 1 minus a half is 1 half. I can write this as x plus, the square root of x plus 1, or x plus 1 to the 1 half power. Now notice, I've simplified it. It looks different. And if we just did the domain restriction here, I would say, hey, the domain is x could be greater than or equal to negative 1. But that's not the case, because the function g of x was in a denominator at some point. So once you set up the equation, that's when it's time to find the domain. If it simplifies and, or maybe some factors cancel, you still have to consider what the domain of those factors were. So make sure, before you simplify it, that you determine what the domain of the function is. Now I'm just going to move this out of the way and pull this back in. What we're going to look at is the difference quotient. And honestly, at this point in algebra, you actually know the difference quotient. We're just going to represent it in a new way. Now, what I want to do here is just for a moment review what slope is. Slope, we've defined as rise over run. We've also defined it as the change in y over the change in x. Hopefully, we have this formula right here memorized. This is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. The difference in two points will tell me the slope of any line. But now we're going to look at this new version of it. And this new version is just using function notation. And we call it the difference quotient. Because sometimes we're dealing with functions that are not linear. Maybe we just want to find the average rate of change. And that's what slope tells me. It tells me a rate of change. Well, when we're looking at a function such as this, well, here's my function in red. And this blue line just says, well, this is the average rate of change from here to here. So we have in the blue is called a secant line. It's an average rate of change for a nonlinear function. Well, what I'm looking at here is if my x value, some x value here, this is some x value further down or horizontally shifted down the line here to x plus h, some value, some new value. So if we look at these in function notation, what are my points? Well, this is x and the function evaluated at x. This value right here is x, f of x. But this value, my input, is x plus h, a different x value. And that's going to give me the function evaluated at that x plus h. Now, to find the average rate of change between these two points, we just plug it into our slope equation. So I have f of x plus h. So we're essentially calling this point 2 and this point 1. So this y value minus this y value. And that's what we have here. The function evaluated here minus the function evaluated here, divided by x2 minus x1. Well, my x2 is x plus h, and my uh, x1 is just x, right? Now, if we do a little simplification here, well, these parentheses really aren't necessary. And if I have x minus an x, combine these like terms, x minus x is no more x's. So our simplified difference quotient, which is just the change in, uh, in the rise over run here, change in y over change in x, we get this, which we call the difference quotient. Now, let's see, how can we evaluate the difference quotient? Well, let's say we have this function, and I want to find a new value of x horizontally shifted either left or right. It doesn't matter what h is. It could be positive, could be negative. So if I use my function notation and just plug it in there, it's 2 minus x plus h squared. And I'm going to do a little bit of simplification right here. I just have to FOIL this out and then distribute a negative. So I get 2 minus x squared 
uh, minus 2xh minus h squared. So if you want to FOIL that out in the margins yourself so you can see how I got this, this is f of x plus h. Now I'm actually going to use the difference quotient. f of x plus h, which is 2 minus x squared minus 2xh minus h squared, that's my function evaluated at that, minus f of x. So that I'm just plugging it into the difference quotient. This y value minus that y value. all divided by h. So if we do some simplification here, if I distribute this negative, because we don't want to make any sign errors, that's why I used the parentheses initially, we see that uh, we can actually combine some like terms. Here I have 2 and a negative 2. Well, they cancel out, don't they? Here I have a negative x squared and a positive x squared. Well, they cancel out. Well, that's good news. So let's see what, we, what we're left with. After doing some simplification, I have negative 2xh minus h squared all over h. And hopefully, we're looking at this and we're saying, hey, is there anything more that I can simplify? Well, I look at the top two terms, and I say, hey, I can uh, factor out an h. So I'm just going to rewrite this as h times negative 2x minus an h. Now I can reduce. This h reduces that h, and I get negative 2x minus h. So honestly, this was a lot of tedious work, right? We had to uh, do some foiling and distributing, and then plug them into the difference quotient, which we really know is slope. And then we had to combine like terms and do all this, some factoring, canceling. Why? Why would we do something like this? Well, this right here the difference quotient, negative 2x minus h, is a value that I can use to find the average rate of change between any two points, no matter where it is on this function, because the function is nonlinear. So maybe I want to find it between the values 4 and 5, or maybe I want to find it between negative 7 and 12. I can find the average rate of change between any two points with this simple linear equation here, negative 2x minus h. If I know what x is and I know what my horizontal transform is, the next number I'm moving to, I can just plug it into there and I can find the average rate of change of any two points on my nonlinear function. So this has been College Algebra, section 3.1, functions. Thank you for watching.